It is a distinct honor for the Associated Student Speakers Program to have as our guest today Mr. Roy Wilkins, Executive Director of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Mr. Wilkins is internationally recognized as an articulate spokesman in the struggle for racial equality. He is also involved directly with the social, economic, and cultural problems in America's Negro population. Currently, the NAACP and its Legal Defense and Educational Fund is involved in an intensive program to secure broad-scale enforcement of provisions of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Shortly after Mr. Wilkins' presentation, at approximately 1 o'clock, there will be an informal question and discussion coffee hour next door in the men's lounge. All those who wish to come are invited to do so. At this time, it gives me great pleasure indeed to present to you Mr. Roy Wilkins. Thank you, Mr. Howard, and uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen of UCLA. I, um, I always get a little apprehensive at introductions uh, that, that say that I'm or imply that I'm an authority on the on civil rights because these days I want to assure you that everybody is an authority on civil rights. Uh, we must have at least 6,999 authorities on civil rights uh, west of the Sierra Nevada mountains. Uh, we have, of course, four times that number east of the Sierra Nevada. But um, as one who is laboring in one corner of the vineyard, and I say that not uh, with any false modesty because this is a tremendous uh, wide vineyard that extends beyond the confines of the United States. Indeed, it involves the whole question of how people are going to live together if they, if they are going to live uh, and uh, under what circumstances and uh, with ki what kind of uh, appreciation. I suppose it's perfectly in order to uh, congratulate you on getting into the Rose Bowl, speaking of something not connected with civil rights. Uh, I read where they didn't expect you to do it. And... Uh, Somebody else might have made it, you know, like Mike Garrett and USC. You know. But uh, you took care of that little situation uh, when you had to. And uh, now you're going to meet the football champions of the um, little club from which I graduated, the Big Ten. Um, I was at Michigan State some time ago and uh, despite all indications to the contrary they do have some students there uh, uh, they study too they <laughs> ask questions I assure you so in addition to the football team they have students I think probably it's, uh, it's well, too, to uh, open this, since we're talking about football, to tell you a little story about North Carolina and football and civil rights, it happens to be. I was there in uh, Charlotte uh, last Sunday. And uh, as you know, there was a bombing of four homes in Charlotte. And it was difficult for any outsiders to understand why these homes should have been bombed, because all the men uh, had been active in civil rights for many years. Kelly Alexander, the president of the NAACP in the state, and uh, a, a lawyer there who had uh, been active with the NAACP and had just been appointed a United States commissioner, and a dentist, a young dentist who had a long record of active NAACP and civil rights activity. Uh, so nobody could understand why. And it seemed to us, finally, that it was a football player in a football game that was responsible. And one of the penalties of desegregation, I guess, one of the things we'll have to live with, it seems that a high school in Charlotte has 
completely desegregated and by now they all they have a negro on the football team and he is the star of the team scored eleven out of nineteen touchdowns and one thing or another certainly nobody could be accused in at this particular transition period of giving him the ball in order to give him an opportunity in order to make a record you see so he must have been good let's say and they pick an all-star team to play a South Carolina team every year and although they picked him on this team and although everybody in the city understood he was the best football player they had the coach refused to use him in the South Carolina game and when he announced that he was not going to do so the NAACP lawyer filed a suit to enjoin the game from being held or something or anything like that and the others testified that this was no, no good and somebody threw dynamite at their homes. Now this is a direct tie up with football and the NACP. But the other side of the coin is that as I was running to catch an airplane, the man stopped me and said, you know, I'm president of the Darlington, North Carolina NACP. And I want to tell you about our football player there. I said, how are you getting along down there? He said, fine. He said, you know, we have a colored boy on the football team and we played another team here last week. And there was one fellow, there always is at every football game, one fellow getting up yelling, you know, kill him, stop that so-and-so, you black so-and-so, and blah, 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 and I ought to kick your teeth out. And what are you doing that on our, to our boys for? And everybody was pretty disgusted. And finally, the Darlington fans, one of them stood up and said, hey, you. He said, you want to kick somebody? You try kicking this 260 pounds right here. He said, we don't kick our kids over in Darlington. And if you want to kick that boy, you come over and kick me. Well, I thought this was pretty good. This was uh, two commentaries on football and what it has done in civil rights in North Carolina. This is a small town in North Carolina, but here was a white fan refusing to allow another town to ride herd on his his particular uh, Negro football player. Well, if you were, if you were on the f football team of UCLA, you, you probably wouldn't be here today. So uh, I'll have to talk to you some about something else besides football. I want to say, uh, repeat what I said at the outset, this is the most important issue uh, facing uh, our domestic economy because it's tied to all the things that we want this country to become and indeed all the things we want the world to become. This is what makes it important. It's a vindication of our pretensions or it is not. And moreover and above that, it represents a people-to-people -people relationship. How, how do you feel about people? Are you a human being or are you a part of a machine? And how do you think government ought to function in the lives of people? This is what makes the whole question important. It's a test of the durability and workability. Last summer, uh, last fall when I was, was in Europe, uh, one of the observers over there said to me, you people in the United States, are too nervous about communism. He said, you know, you're, you, you have no, nothing to fear about communism. You're too far ahead of them. And you're always worrying about communists under the bed or under the rug or somewhere. He said, but what you ought to be concerned about and what the rest of the world is concerned about is how you handle your human problem. What do you do with your Negroes, for example? What do you do about immigration? What do you do about mobility from the bottom to the top in American society? What do you do about education? And what do you do about poverty and employment? He said, these are the things the world is interested in. The world isn't interested in whether you're one up on Moscow or Moscow is one up on you. And he said, I think if you would pay attention to your civil rights problem, and I speak now of the whole American public, then I think you would be on the right track as to how 
important you are. It seems to me the college has recognized this a long time ago before a lot of the American general public did because the record of what you have done in, in numerous campuses over the country looms large in the civil rights picture. And I just heard uh, two minutes before I came in this room about a plan hurriedly uh, uh, put together to have students work on ongoing projects that are now underway during their winter vacation. And I believe they're going to ask uh, volunteers to put down their names to work on certain specific projects. Well, this is one, one only one indication. If this campus is typical, I could ask those who've been down to Mississippi or below the Mason-Dixon line to hold up their hands and I'd get plenty of hands. I was at the Massachusetts, Insti uh, not Massachusetts, the second best one, Caltech <laughs> in Pasadena. And uh, the students there with their slide rules and their engineering and math problems uh, were still not too busy to be interested in the human problems below the Mason and Dixon line. When I was at Oberlin, I had the same experience. So that you're, if you're typical, you have been there and you have seen. And what you have brought back and told your people in your hometowns, in your churches, your sororities and fraternities, and in your clubs, and what you have written in your slick paper magazines and the interviews you've given to your hometown newspapers, uh, these are, are more important than any testimony of Jim Farmer or Roy Wilkins or Martin Luther King or any of the rest of us. Of course we know what goes on in Mississippi. We've known for years. My family was born in Mississippi. My father grew up in Mississippi. By the time he was 19 and a half years old, he'd had Mississippi up to here and he decided he wasn't going to raise a family in Mississippi. And we went to St. Louis uh, in time for me to be born there, away from Holly Springs. But I've been back in Mississippi. I know plenty of Mississippians. And what I tell you about Mississippi is there's nothing compared to what one of your students who goes down there and lives with it and comes back and says. Last year I was at Portland, Oregon. And it so happened the day I got there, a Portland, Oregon college student was arrested in Mississippi. And his story was across all the newspapers and on all the television and radio stations. And I might as well have gone home and sat down. They didn't need any speech by me on civil rights. Because what Sweeney said about what they did in Mississippi and the Mississippi system converted 380,000 people in Portland because it was their boy who was suffering uh, from this and not some mythical person or some Negro family uh, that you did not know. I ought to say it seems to me that the present mood in the civil rights struggle is marked by an undercurrent of restlessness and resentment and frustration and even anger that's been bubbling since the 1954 decision on Brown. You know, we have these eruptions, and you have a bombing here, and you have, uh, well, for you, you have a Watts here, and for us, we have a Harlem, or you have a protest or a demonstration in Forest City, Arkansas, or in some other unlikely place, Crawfordsville, Georgia, and you say to yourself, uh, why did this happen? What triggered it? I thought the civil rights question was at least simmering. Now it's exploding. Well, you know, it just doesn't explode without some tinder underneath there. And the tinder underneath has been this resentment, and I date it from the Brown decision in 1954, because Brown decision said segregation in schools and in American life is outside the Constitution, cannot be. Now, the, the Negro felt that for 55 years he had struggled to get the Brown decision, to get this affirmation of his citizenship status. And he got it in 54. And it was met by defiance and trickery and betrayal and distortion and resistance. 
So in effect, he had won, but he had not won. Because after he had won, according to all the rules, they said, you be patient and take it according to law and order and go up through the courts, go to Supreme Court, and once you get the square issue before the Supreme Court where they can't dodge on this little angle or that little angle of the question as they so apt to, are so apt to do, once you get a square presentation and you win, then you're in. You know, it's like hitting a home run and then have somebody say, well, it went outside by half an inch. And that's what happened at Brown. And the Negroes said, well, okay, we played according to the rules. We did everything they said we're supposed to do. And they reneged. Then we had the period of sit-ins and marches and protests and demonstrations. And after that, we had the Civil Rights Act of 1954 and the Voting Act of 1965 with the support of JFK and LBJ. We got public accommodations in the, in the Civil Rights Act and we got Title VI. We got six or eight other provisions, but those are the two main ones. And in the, in the Voting Rights Act, we got federal registrars. And then what happened? And then they didn't enforce it so, so Federal registrars only went down to 12 counties the first time, and when some complaints went, they sent down 20 more, and they're just functioning so-so uh, down there. And the voting totals are going up, but they're going up because of the activity of the private organizations that work there. And the voting registrars are, of course, handicapped a little bit, uh, by the fact that you have apathy and fear and intimidation and terror. But here we have nothing being done to overcome those obstacles. And as far as Title VI is concerned, uh, we have complaints there, and the Negroes feel that, that they have a cause for a new uneasiness. If I would characterize this uh, period of the a civil rights movement is uneasy and resentful and suspicious, skeptical, and even cynical on the part of some people. Because, you know, on Title VI, the HEW accepted assurances that you're going to desegregate in order to give them the money. The law says that if the money is used in a discriminatory manner, it shall be withheld with certain steps uh, in between. But uh, a lot of people filled out a piece of paper and said, yes, we're desegregating our schools or we have a plan and sent it on in and HEW said, okay, you get the money. You know, if you don't withhold the money, you don't get any action. You know, you, you can go to the bursar's office and spin a tail as long as from here over to West Los Angeles. But sooner or later, you're going to have to lay it on the line. The tuition has got to be there. You, somebody's got to pay it, either the Ford Foundation, your mama and papa, or you. It's the money that counts. And in the Title VI, the withholding power is the power. Withhold the money, and that has not been done. You know that we only had uh, less than 1% a year desegregation from 54 to 64, and you know you aren't going to have more than token unless you can get some sweeping, com compelling action across the board. You even had de facto segregation in the North. You had it right here in California. You had California is very proud of its school system, very proud of its universities, even proud of Berkeley. Uh, that is, uh, some parts of Berkeley, but it's a big campus, you know, and and, uh, but here in California, you had de facto segregation uh, creeping all over the state. Uh, the northern position and the California position was that desegregation, uh, I mean, segregation does not exist. A man said to me on the plane the other night, he said, you know, Mr. Wilkins, I don't understand this civil rights question. Of course, he was a square, you know, he really wasn't with it. Uh, he said, I don't understand the civil rights question. He said, when I went to school, we had a Negro in our class. This was the end all and be all as far as he was concerned. This made everything all right. 
and it didn't cause him. Now, he's a mathematician. He works in some kind of complicated business for the Navy, and he flies all over the world with a slide rule and a whole lot of books, and he figures out what to do about this, that, and the other, probably trying to get, uh, who knows, uh, an aircraft carrier to the moon or something like that. I don't know. But for him, the civil rights question is all settled because a Negro was in his class 35 years ago when he was in college. Well, the, the North has had this kind of myopia on segregation. California's had it. And the answer to the fact that, to their contention that it doesn't exist is to be found in the fact that the NAACP is carrying on action in 80 cities in 15 states of the North against de facto segregation that exists in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, in San Bernardino, in San Diego, in New York, in Saginaw, Michigan, and in Cleveland, and a whole lot of other places right here in the North. What are the complaints? An old school plant. In Boston, out of eight schools ruled to be unsafe for use by the Boston school engineers, seven of them are occupied by the children of minority groups. Now, they're unsafe for, according to the Boston's own rule. And this complaint is from Negroes all over the country about school plants, about right here in California, one of the cities reported, I think it was Monterey Peninsula, reported that uh, they're not supposed to have any gerrymandered school districts, but the zigzagging of one line leads us to be suspicious. This is from California. You have poor, inexperienced teachers, you have restricted curriculum, uh, you have no counseling uh, of Negro kids. In Boston, they told Negro girls not to study typing and shorthand, uh, to study cooking and laundering and baking and that sort of thing, so you could get a job. And in Michigan, we found Negro counselors, not white counselors, telling Negro high school students not to study chemistry because they couldn't get to be chemical engineers. And if they had looked around them or jumped in a, you know, even a Falcon or a Rambler American and driven 30 miles, they would have run over probably a dozen Negro chemists. Yet here were Negroes telling Negro kids that they didn't have to do this. Then there was no history of the Negro, of course. I don't have to tell you that. You, you've had to dig it out here in UCLA, not as bad as years ago. We had a man on our staff who graduated from Yale, and he said he'd finished Yale, finished the graduate school, and got his degree before he ever found out that there were black soldiers in George Washington's army. He thought that George Washington's army was a white army that defeated the British and that we colored people ought to be grateful because all the white folks had fought and died for us and our freedom. And he found out that among uh, the people who froze on at Valley Forge and left their bloody footprints in the snow, that there was some black feet and some black blood there too. But he never learned it in college. It wasn't until he got out of college that he found this out. In California, you have all kinds of, all kinds of excuses. Down in San Diego, they said the school board is adamant. The administration is adamant and the school board is evasive and unresponsive. In Palm Springs, they had only two Negroes to go to college. Out of 14 years of Negro graduates in Palm Springs, only two went to college. And nobody in Palm Springs was disturbed about this. No school board member, no high school teacher, no counselor, nobody. They never thought it was odd that in this beautiful paradise, I, it's supposed to be paradise. Uh, anyway, it rains out here, and it doesn't rain in New York. And uh, I suppose uh, that makes part of it paradise. But I, nobody was disturbed that in Palm Springs, where they have more swimming pools than anywhere else per capita in the whole world, that they only had two Negro graduates going to college in 14 years. Sausalito up here across the, George, uh, uh, across the Golden Gate Bridge 
and Berkeley were the only two towns that really got a clean bill of health. Uh, in, um, in San Bernardino, a school official was quoted as saying, no, we aren't going to call on the state for any help in de facto segregation. I suppose, he said, it, will, it must be eliminated in the end. But how we will go about it and how fast, I don't know. What end? 1980, 1990, 2010? In the end. Now that wasn't from Alabama or Mississippi. That was from San Bernardino, the state of California. And we had all of these things in Santa Cruz, and I, I only cite this as the last, last one. Santa Cruz had a curious one about the Negroes being beguiled with praise of Negro athletes as against the provisions for Negro scholarship and opportunity. And that the Negroes were being told, well, you have a man on the basketball team, you have a man on the football team, on the track team, and he's a star, and what are you complaining about school for? Now, California does have some good things. State policy is like New York is against discrimination, like New Jersey is against discrimination, also has compensatory, uh, a provision for compensatory education, and it also has a provision about textbooks and about what to teach. Here's a little book put out by the New York City a Board of Education, The Negro in American History. Uh, if we had 10,000 uh, boards of education over the country distributing this as reading material, we might do away eventually with the notion that this is a white man's country and the Negro ought to be glad to receive what we give him. And uh, as one Southern student said, they have their own schools and we pay the taxes for them. We pay the taxes for them. And they ought to be glad to get what schools we give them. They ought to be glad to use last year's textbooks this year after we get through with them. In one of the northern cities, not the southern cities, the Negro kids in the platoon system were asked, when do they study? Because the ones that went to school from 7 to 12 had to leave their books there so the ones that went to school from 12 to 5 could use them. And so somebody said, well, how do you get your homework? They said, we don't get it. This is Chicago, 1965. When I say there's an undercurrent of cynicism and uneasiness and resentment, this contributes to it. In the voting situation, You, we need more registrars and we need to crack down on enforcement. We need to get rid of some of the terror. Uh, the people are being, uh, being refused the idea of voting. Right here in Watts, you had your unemployment. You're all too young to remember the Great Depression. But in the 1930s, we had the Great Depression. And what sparked it? I mean, what sparked the terrible feeling there? It was a 25% unemployment. And people were talking about overthrowing the government, getting rid of Washington, throwing Congress in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, installing communism, socialism, any kind of ism that would provide jobs. But in Watts, you had 30% unemployment much more unemployment than you had in the Great Depression, which caused our country to go to the brink of revolution. And yet people said to me, well, why do you think they did what they did in Watts? Do you approve of that sort of, of course I don't approve, but who approves of rioting as a means of solving a social question? But it was inevitable that you would have some kind of an upheaval and outburst with 30% unemployment. Then, of course, we have the far right contributing to the uneasiness. I read in your morning paper here, the great newspaper of the Southland. <laughs> a 
I'm serious about that. They they carry my column every week, every week. And uh, this is uh, what I read in the, in the in the Los Angeles Times that down here in Long Beach, they've discovered that the president of a young Republican club is a Nazi party member, American Nazi party member, and the secretary is also. Uh, you know, up in New York, we found out that an investigator in the New York City Department of Welfare was the uh, Kliegel of the Ku Klux Klan in the state of New Jersey. Of course, he didn't, he didn't make any money as uh, Kliegel, and he had to work somewhere, so he worked on the public payroll of the city of New York. Well, he doesn't now. They finally put him out. But uh, this far-right business, I, uh, I spoke yesterday up in San Francisco, and and they had somebody outside passing out these uh, leaflets about uh, read the biography of Roy Wilkins and uh, about is the NAACP subversive. This is put out by the Patrick Henry Group <laughs> in uh, Richmond, Virginia, P.O. Box 217. I think I'll have to send for some additional copies. <laughs> uh, but uh, two years ago, I went to speak down in Disneyland. I emphasize I went to speak down there. And uh, they greeted me with an editorial saying that, that I was coming to bring a red message to Disneyland and for Disneyland not to listen to me. But. The far right and its distortion of the civil rights question. Uh, here you have birchers in police departments. Uh, I was trying to get a taxi in New York City one day, and the policeman said to me, Mr. Wilkins, you better go over on that corner over there. I didn't know him from Adams or Fox. And so he said to me, I, I recognize you from your picture. He said, it's uh, uh, hanging up in the station house. <laughs> Of course, I, <laughs> I felt a little apprehensive about this. I, I don't exactly relish the photograph hanging up in a police station. But it, uh, I found out from one of the colored policemen, I was to speak for the Guardian Society, which was uh, largely composed of Negro policemen in the New York police force. And they had put a poster up there advertising I was going to speak. And the only reason they were able to get a poster there was because the policemen who were members of the John Birch Society had been able to get a poster up announcing a John Birch Society meeting. And so the Negro policeman said, well, if you can put up one about the John Birch Society, you can put one up about Wilkins. Now, this is only an illustration of the fact that the Birch Society is there in our police department. And when a policeman acts, does he act as a policeman? Or does he act as a John Birch Society member? And this is the question that nobody is able to answer very well. Well, November 2nd showed that the Negro was answering at least in one way in the voting situation. He's voting independently, voting out from under the Democratic Party. He shocked me. In uh, New York City, uh, he, he disregarded the advice of Adam Clayton Powell. And this is unheard of, of course. He didn't completely go over to the Republicans, oh no, or to Lindsay. But whereas some of the districts had been eight to one Democratic, they were now only two to one Democratic. So the best we can say is that Adam had a smaller voice in this election than he has had in other elections. But this is only one indication of the fact that the Negro voter is cynical and disillusioned and that he's not tied to the Democratic Party. He almost elected a mayor of Cleveland. And don't tell me that it was a near disaster because I don't know of any American city, including Los Angeles, that could be any worse run under a Negro mayor than it is under some of the mayors now sitting. <laughs> you see. 
because a good many of the mayors do not exhibit any special genius or talent for the job, if you know what I mean. And the Negro coming in, say, without any experience at all, could hardly do worse. He, he might, of course, always possible, but um, I'm inclined to think not. Anyway, he almost selected a mayor in Cleveland. The question uh, that I leave with you today is, in this emergency, which is pressuring us from all sides, can the United States act fast enough? Can the white people change fast enough? Can they understand the urgency of the problem fast enough? Will the Negroes understand the problem presented to them as they emerge into increasing freedom? because they have a problem also, and they have a responsibility, and they have an obligation. And you can say, well, they've carried their obligation. They worried with it all this time, and so they have. And they've done remarkably well with it. But as they emerge into the new atmosphere that we fondly hope is being created, they have additional duties and additional responsibilities. And some of them, involve their outward relationship with the white community and some of them involve their inward relationship in their own community. Their revision of standards, their imposition of the, of the excellence, their judgment of behavior in the general society as against the behavior of an in-group against the out-group or an out-group, if you will, against the in-group. Uh, all of these uh, have to be considered. And the white people have to make almost a complete revision. Not you, not all of you at least, because the college students have shown that they understand some of the basics of this problem. And they've also shown that they can change. If not completely, they can change part way and they can recognize intellectually as well as emotionally the import of the problem. And if they don't recognize it as a great constitutional issue or as a test of America or any of the other great phrases that we use, they at least recognize it as an, an immense and total injustice of one human being to another. They recognize the misuse of power and the distortion of the haves against the have-nots. This they understand, and they understand it perhaps much more clearly than their fathers and mothers did. And so I'm not so concerned, even with the young conservatives. I'm not concerned, even with a man like William Buckley, whom I understand you're going to have the great privilege and honor of hearing shortly. Uh, he's going to be the, probably the most articulate spokesman outside of John Russolo, that the conservatives can muster in this country. And if you haven't heard Buckley wiggle his way down a tightrope, be present. I assure you it's worth the, uh, the price of admission. <laughs> but um, but uh, seriously, the, the imperative is upon us for change. And I don't know how you personally feel about it, I can only say to you that the events that are taking place today may shape uh, the country for years to come. And I would wish for you and your generation that you would do better by this question than your mothers and fathers did before you. Some of them, some of them went out on a limb. Some of them have been fighters from their earliest days. Some of them have understood this. If we hadn't had some of them on our side, we would have succumbed. Because the Negro, as President Johnson said in his Howard University speech, cannot do it alone. Did you ever hear the rationalization that the immigrants came here and they couldn't speak a word of English and they had no money, and they came from terror and oppression, and they came to the new land, 
and they made it. And why can't the colored people do it as well? Well, Johnson put it in his Howard University speech last June, the commencement address, that the other minorities did not have the great handicap that faced the Negro, a prejudice based on skin color whose dark intensity is matched by no other prejudice in the world. People who otherwise say are rational and are willing to grant are not willing to give on skin color. It isn't logical, it isn't sensible, but they won't do it. They won't sit down by you, they won't eat with you, they won't live in the neighborhood with you, and they don't want their kids to go to school with you. They don't know you, and they don't care. All they care is this. And a Pole or an Irishman or an Italian who came here and couldn't speak and who didn't know nevertheless had the right color scheme and when he did learn when the Irish found out how to vote they know who to vote for and when the Italians learn they learn and when they save their money they could buy a home and the Poles went on likewise and every other minority but the Negro carries a flag, a banner, on his face. And President Johnson recognized this. Ah, my friends, our job, not merely for the sake of the Negro, but for the sake of ourselves, for the kind of white world we live in, I say we, I identify myself with you, for the kind of a world that says, because we're white, it's right, and it's this, and it's that, and the other. And you're just as lopsided as the Negro who says, I hate white people and I believe in black nationalism and if they won't give it to me, I'll take it from them. He's lopsided and you're lopsided. Let's get rid of this for your sake, for our sake, and for the sake of the kind of world that we all want to live in. Thank you.